So, um, yeah, we were just covering some of the, the verses, two shall agree in Matthew 18, 19, and explaining that that's just giving the remnant authority to act in Christ's absence. Faith as a mustard seed has to do with their unbelief, uh, that, that Matthew 17, 20, that has to do with the unbelief that we see at the end of Matthew 16. Uh, another example, Matthew 19, Matthew 19, 26. Here's one that if you want to comfort somebody, you go, you know, people will use this kind of a verse. Matthew 26. <clears throat> but Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. But if you look at what the story is up to this point, you know, you just pull that verse out. Like I say, you put that on your wall on a poster and it makes for a great poster. But it's if you're going to use that to comfort somebody you're missing what the actual point is here there's um uh, verse 16 and behold one came and said unto him good master what good thing shall i do that i may have eternal life and then he's going to give him a list of things to do and he um and uh then he goes down, the young man, verse 20, saith, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And uh, then he tells them, if you're going to be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, in verse 21. And so this man is trying to save himself. He's trying to save himself through his actions. And he's saying, well, look at, I'm self-righteous. Look at all these, these things that I'm able to do. I'm able to do all these things. And so when Jesus says, with men... This is impossible, but with God, things God, all things are possible. And it, and the question there is in verse twenty five: Who then can be saved? Man can't save himself, but with God, all things are possible. And so again, it's a, a verse that gets misused to try and comfort people. Another example would be Matthew chapter ten: the whole idea are not two sparrows sold for a farthing. Maybe let's go there. Matthew chapter ten. And Jessica, I'll have you read verses 29 through 31. Matthew 10, 29 through 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. And so if you're you're following along with the whole story here, um, this is a really interesting chapter. I'd like to teach the whole thing, but we got to go quickly. In verse, let's see, 22, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. In verse 28, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And so uh, the issue here, this idea that, um, you know, when people want to use these verses as comforting, see where, you know, the very hairs of our head are all numbered. Uh, first off, you know, that's, you got to look at who's even talking to. He's talking to the apostles. It's at the beginning of chapter 10. And then secondly, you know, you're really not even realizing what the, the whole point here. We, we did a study on this and who was going to enter into the kingdom. And so um, that's why we studied that previously, but it's uh, taking a verse and using just, you know, one little thing that sounds good, using it to comfort people. I tell you, when you do that, though, people are going to, if if you're good, hopefully you get them excited about their Bible and someday they're going to read the rest of that passage and they're going to realize that you used a verse that, um, used a verse out of context. I want to pull... There's one more that I want to look at before we dive into, I want to look at Ephesians chapter three, because there's, um, what is it? Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly. There's one that I think gets misused quite a bit. So I want to look at that, but here's one more. And I'm going to try to share my screen if I can. I have not done this in, uh, in WebEx yet. So we'll see how this works. And what I'm going to look at for you guys on the other phone, I'm going to look at Romans uh, 8.26. And so I took this, I got to make this bigger. I 
And so I took this screenshot because it was a good example of what you'll find in Bibles. So you got to remember that now right here, you're going to see a paragraph break, right? It's indented. You see the same thing for Romans 8, 29. And this Bible, he, it is even taken the liberty to add in some, some headers here so that, and I'll tell you when I, when I'm doing a Bible study or preaching, those can be extremely helpful because if you're just looking now, this Bible that I preach out of, has nothing well you can't see it's going to be too small it has absolutely nothing in the center it has no headers it just has numbers and i think that's the best type of bible to to read out of this one here though shows something different that one shows that it's going to lump verses 26 and 29 or 28 together 26 27 and 28 and let me read that so this is oftentimes used to talk about, say, unanswered prayers. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So that's how this, now this, uh, this came out of my King James Bible. You can see it says word search edition. That's a Bible that, um, it's a Bible program that I use. So I'm gonna stop sharing, but I want you to see that because you might be looking at a Bible that's got these headlines written in it. You might be, yours might be showing paragraph breaks in, in those same spots. But the Bible that I've always preached out of, it would not lump those verses together. The Bible that I preach out of would lump verses 26 and 27 together. And this one, some of them have a little paragraph marker. This one just has a bold number and it says that a new thought begins uh, at verse 28 or a, a paragraph marker, I would call it. And so if you read it that way, and maybe let me start by just starting in, in um, well, uh, Richard, would you, would you do me a favor and read say, um, read verses 18, well, why don't you read verses 18 through 22? Verse 18, <clears throat> for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected him, subjected the same in hope. Uh, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creature groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And so it's talking about the, thank you, it's talking about the curse there. And then in verse 23, though, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the, what, the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. I think. Dan was just talking about that a couple of weeks ago. So there's this future uh, future glorification, this, this adoption to the redemption of our body. We have that to look forward to. Now, if you read, um, I'm going to read verse 28 again, but I'm going to read it together with a few other verses. Verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow us. So we're talking about his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. And I say predestinate to what? To be conformed to the image of his son. That's the predestination there. To be conformed to the image of his son. That's what we were just talking about back in verse 23, the redemption of our body, that he might, and I'm back in verse 29, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, 
and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things of God before us who can be against us? So when you take verse 28 and you, you just want to say, and you just cut out verses 26 through 28, and again, you'll use that to say, well, you know, we don't know what to pray for, but we do know that all things work together for the good to them that love God. But you're kind of skipping out the last part of that verse, which is to them who are called according to his purpose. When you read that, then you realize, and, and then you start reading down the next few verses, you realize, oh, for whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate. And, um, you know, and again, the, to be conformed to the image of his son. So we're talking about the curse, but we're talking about despite this curse, we've got this future redemption to look forward to. And then you, you get to verse, and you'll look at it a little bit differently. You see, that's why I don't like um, uh, this. Again, this Bible here just has bold numbers. I can read it without even noticing them. I don't like when Bibles take and then they put like a, they tell you what, it, they tell you what you're about to read. I don't like that because I've seen a lot of them that are wrong. They'll say something is about, about, um, I don't know, the rapture or something, and it, it's, it's not about that at all. Like when you actually read the context, you realize that that's not what it's about. So um, there's a verse that oftentimes gets used when people are, you know, saying, well, I don't understand why, you know, I've been praying about this, but it didn't happen. People want to use verse 28 as a comforting verse, and it is very comforting. It ought to be extremely comforting. The, per the reason why I did this study was that to show people that, okay, so regardless of where you're at on this a continuum of of thinking that you know where you think God might be intervening or not, and I said to start all this study that I, I don't see I don't see any of this being about intervention. But let's say you you are there. These verses are talking about something that's even better than that. If we're asking God to intervene here on earth, but God's telling us, look, you are predestined to be con uh, conformed to the image of the Son. Like you got something even better to look forward to. You got. There'll be a time when you won't even be dealing with this curse. Uh, that's what should be comforting. That's one thing that I think we can all agree on is the the amazingness of that. And I said that I remember when when somebody first told me that she couldn't wait for the rapture, and I re that was when I was had just started to understand salvation, and I thought she was crazy because I was twenty some years old. I was in the best shape of my life, loving life, and I thought, why would I want this to end now? Now that I understand what these verses are, I realize my future is a lot better than what I'm dealing with now, right? Of course, as you you gain a little bit more experience in the world, you start to realize it's not all it's made out to be. Um, we've certainly got something better to look forward to. So those are a few that I covered with the group, and I did them in a lot more detail. But there's at least there's one more that I want to look at, and then maybe we'll we talked a little bit last week about God's will, and so we'll finish there. So turn to Ephesians. And um, we're going to get to the verses here at the end of Ephesians chapter 3. So we're pretty much going to stay in Ephesians here to finish out the, the study. You know, a, another example of this, uh, the, the verse that I'm going for in Ephesians. Um, let's see here. Dick, if you would read for me verses... and 21, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. All right, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Yeah, so there's... um. That ought to be a really, that is a really comforting verse, and it should be. Now to, unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Um, that is a great verse. It gets me excited every time I read it. That, what I'll say is that that doesn't mean, now I, again, I've heard this from others that, well, you know, if you were to, let's say you were to ask, I don't know, you're having problems making your uh, mortgage payments. So you were to ask God to get you a new job so that you could more easily make your mortgage payment. He not only can do that, but he'll get you an even better job than what you asked for. That 
that's a, a way that this verse is used incorrectly. I don't think anybody on this call is doing that. Um, but you know, again, that is with that is not keeping Second Corinthians chapters four and five in mind. That's keeping worrying about things that are temporal. Uh, but if you shift your focus to something that's eternal, you get a different picture. Another one would be that gets used Ephesians one eleven, and these are verses that would get used to say that, well, see, there's not really chance. There aren't things that could be done by chance because you'd say in verse 11, whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So that's that's one that would get used. I would use it in a different way, but it would get used to say, see, God's working everything according to his own will. He's doing this. He's moving everything around um, according to his own will. But but if you just read, if you just look closer at the start of the verse, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the what? Redemption of the purchased possession. Um, we start to understand this a little bit better. And and uh, the, it says in verses 8 and 9, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So when you're looking at all of what the Ephesians is teaching us, you wouldn't think that this is just him moving things around, but it's recognizing that there is a plan for the body of Christ. And that plan for the body of Christ, right, is that we're, we're seated in the heavenlies and, and so on. I want to um, to look at chapter 3, though. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start in chapter 2 and just start to look at um, look at what ha what is happening leading up to chapter 3. And, if, and you understand when you read through... Um, when you read through Ephesians, you've got essentially three chapters here of of Paul just explaining to you what the body of Christ is. It's a lot of, and then you're going to get to chapter four, and he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy. So now he's going to start talking about what you're going to do. And then, uh, and then of course, he's going to say in chapter six that, you know, you're going to stand, I believe he says it here, and let's see, uh, Verse 11, you know, he starts then talking about put on the whole armor of God that may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. But he spends the first three chapters just explaining what the body of Christ is. And it's such a, a, a beautiful thing when you look at it. So Ephesians 2 verse 1, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And so, um, got to skip further ahead in my notes and what I wanted to, but. Um, you have the quickened, right? So he's speaking here to uh, this specific church. Um, but but what he's saying is that in that, when he, he quickened us, but before he did that, we were dead, past. You know, the, the thing about this, these first three chapters is all past tense. You're seated, you've been predestinated, and you just go through the list. If I just went through the list, you'd see the stuff's all past tense, right? Um, but Paul is saying here at the beginning of chapter two, you walked according to the course of this world. There was not, um, we were outside of fellowship with God. And I don't say that as in we were backsliding. I say that as in uh, there was a time where all of us did not understand the work that Christ did for us on the cross. And so we had a problem right there. Verse Verse four, Jessica, would you read verses four through seven? In Ephesians two? Yes. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, 
even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So we had a problem. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but there is a, a just a, a beautiful contrast here. God, who is rich in mercy, for His love wherewith He loved us, and again did it when we were dead in our sins, quicken us together. So He did that past tense together with Christ. And um, in verse five, it reiterates what we probably all know: "For by grace are ye saved." Um, Verses 6 and 7, it's the purpose of this identification with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection so we can serve in God's plan in heaven, right? Um, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we can serve together in heaven. And then he's going to talk more about, you know, th this work here, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. That's verse 8, verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk with him. So we had a problem. God has taken care of that problem. Yet when we were still dead in our sins, um, and, and he's, he's sort of solved that problem for us. Verses 11 and 12. Wherefore, remember that, you know, this is where I, I really want to get to, because this is where we're going to start to tie into what we see at the end of chapter 20. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So we had we had a time where we had a problem. Then I remember back before the dispensation of grace is ushered in. How were we? Well, let's go and um, I can see you, Richard. So I'm going to ask you to read again. Genesis, let's read Genesis 12 verses 1 through 3. My uh, pages are sticking together because it's a new King James version. Oh. And um, so I just got to peel them apart here. Okay, ver chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Uh, now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and i will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing and i will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed yeah and in, in, in thee all families of the earth shall be blessed now that does end up happening paul explains that more in galatians chapter three but right the plan was for Israel to be what? A nation of priests. Now, there's a verse, is it in, I forget where it is now, but where, you know, they, the Gentiles should have been looking on Israel and saying, and, and just, we, we absolutely want what you guys have. That was what should have been happening, but what happens? Christ comes to the earth, they reject him, sends the Holy Spirit, they reject that as well. And they don't want to do that. They want to just stick to their temple, doing their practices. They want to continue to do their works. Um, so we, at this point, we had a, Gentiles on the earth had a major problem because the plan for Israel to, to be a, a kingdom of priests and then minister to the Gentiles, we were in trouble because Israel was not following the plan at all, right? We understand we were, we were separated from them. You got circumcision and uncircumcision. 
they're the ones that were given the promises. They're supposed to be ministering and they're not doing it. Uh, the Gentiles would have a problem. The only way that that we as Gentiles, if we were during that time frame, could have come to God would have been going through the nation of Israel. So we would have had to, but they weren't even ministering. So, you know, you've got this, you can see the problem there that like the Ephesians church would have had if Paul doesn't come with a different message. Ephesians chapter two, and we're going to just read a little bit more and then we'll we'll kind of wrap up this thought. Verse, um, well, verse 12, having, we had, we were strangers from the covenants of promise. We had no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So you were far off, now you're made nigh, for he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So, and then he goes on to say, we're, we're no more strangers. We had a problem, right? The nation of Israel, you got to think about this from their perspective. They were given all of the covenants. Um, they, they've got these amazing promises, and the Gentiles are on the outside looking in. And, and what, what happens here, we have zero hope, but there's an amazing thing that happens. He breaks down the middle wall of partition. He's gonna make us, he's gonna take Jews and Gentiles alike, and he's gonna use them now for the same purpose. He's gonna use them, you know, and, and what you're gonna see here, right? Essentially, it's at this point that the nation of Israel you know, he, he talks about a commonwealth. They had all, they were, he was dealing with them all as one nation, one group, not going to do that anymore. He still got, he still got the little flock. He's got the remnant. That group that actually had believed, he still got a purpose for them on earth. From this point forward, if you're a member of the nation of Israel, you, you, you're going to be coming through the body of Christ. You're going to, that is your chance. He's broken down the middle wall partition. So he had a plan for earth. He's still got that plan and he's got his people for that. But now he's going to start calling out a group and he's going to make, he's going to make this group out of Jews, unbelieving Jews and through the Gentiles. That again, we were, we were in big trouble is what it's telling us in verses 11 and 12. We were strangers. We had no hope. And these people who had all the hope now, guess what? You're in the same boat as those guys. Um, and he breaks down that middle wall. That, folks, is something that if you had to ask, if you had to have asked anybody back during that time frame, how do you think God should solve this problem? I don't, I can't imagine anyone would have said, I know, I got it. He should call out a group of people for heaven. He's going to use Jews and Gentiles alike to do that. No one could have thought of that. And and it's, um, you know, you you read in Romans 11, it talks about, um, it, it talks a little bit more about this with uh, the nation of Israel. It, it had to have been rather shocking and jarring to them. Um, verse, let's see. Um, oh, and, and I wanted to say one more thing about this, and then we'll skip to the end. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So the household of God has two groups in it. It's got the body of Christ now. It's got the little flock. The saints there are the little flock. You're, you're not, it doesn't say that you're, um, uh, that we're, we're fellow citizens with unbelieving Jews. It's saying that we're fellow citizens. There's two purposes, earth and heaven. The little flock, those are the saints being mentioned there. We're the other half of that purpose. And now we're fellow citizens with them. But but for the unbelieving Jews, they're in the same boat that all of us were when we were unsaved. Um, so let's just skip forward then. Now let's get to the actual prayer that we were looking at. 
and I'll read this for you, uh, chapter 3, verse 14. So with all of that in the back of your mind, chapter 3, verse 14, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that's the whole point that he's been making up to here, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. When you read that in the context and you realize that he's not, and then he's going to shift gears in, in chapter 4 1, when you realize that he's explaining to us the difference between heaven and earth, this, there's this whole um, household of God. There's these, these two purposes. He's explaining the body of Christ. The middle wall of partitions broken down, and he's doing something that no one could have imagined. Now, unto him that is able to do, you were, and, and in verse again, back in 2.12, having no hope, you had no hope. But he did something that no one could have thought to even ask for. No one... Um, and he did something more than we could have even thought to have asked for. Uh, and so to use that, that, that verse or verses 20 and 21, to use those, you know, I, I, I said this to start to use those as like a comforting verse to say, well, you know, when somebody comes to you and says, well, you know, my dog just died or what, I, you know, whatever it is. And they, you know, I, and I, like I said, my car broke down. Uh, you know, all these different things happened, and then we can say, well, you know, he, unto him that is able to do, exceed, God can do exceeding abundantly above all you can even ask or think. That verse is extremely comforting, but not for that purpose. Not because I feel like I can ask for something here on earth, something temporary here on earth, and that he's going to do more than I could have asked for. It's talking about, it's talking about the body of Christ and our role in heaven, and the fact that he took Jew and Gentile alike now and is calling us out for that purpose that no one could have possibly thought to ask for. That's what that's about. So again, all these verses, God can, look, these verses are absolutely true. God can uh, do exceeding abundantly above more than we could think. Um, all these verses are great verses. I don't want you to throw them away, but just letting them be in the context that they're about our eternal purpose in heaven. They're not about this temporary experience that we're having on earth. Uh, and when you do that, um, I, I think, you know, we were talking about this at the end of the Bible study. When you're able to do that, man, that is so much more comforting than, than any either than any answered prayer here on earth or not. I mean, uh, we were, we were studying before this, we were studying, We've been studying music, and that's a, you talk about prayer and intervention, that's sort of a big no-no because people don't like to, people don't like when you say something they don't agree with there, and then talk about, you know, somebody's favorite hymn, and that's also another one that tends to be on the sort of do not touch list. And uh, we were singing, or we were uh, looking at Amazing Grace, though, and that idea, when we've been there 10,000 years, I said I have a friend who changes that to be when we've been there 10 million years. Um, and how's it go? You've got it memorized. Yeah, when we've been there 10,000 or 10 million years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. We've got no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. We've been there, we could be there 10,000 10, years. Uh, and of course, that's not, you know, um, but so it, it's, we were basically, we were looking at the lyrics of that song and seeing how it applies to doctrine, but that's a beautiful picture of eternity. After 10,000 years, you've got no less days. So when we get so focused on our earthly experience, um, I think, you know, I, I, I don't want to, um, I just want to comfort people in a different way. I don't want to tell them, well, you know, 
tomorrow will be better. I'm gonna tell them like, there's gonna tomorrow might not be better, but guess what? You have an eternity to look forward to. That I can comfort you with. Uh, it's that future glorification. And um, and again, I think when you start to look through Paul's epistles and just realize how often he does have to deal with earth a little bit, he has to deal with the Corinthians, but don't try to be like the Corinthians, right? They've got a lot of problems they're dealing with, so he's got to correct some things. But other than that, he's uh, he's really focused on that eternal glory. So um, let me finish us with a word of prayer, and then we can we can discuss. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the understanding that you have broken down that middle wall of partition, that we understood that we had no hope. All of us would have had no hope at one point. This group at Ephesus would have had no hope, but that you broke down that middle wall of partition, that you um, have shown us that mystery that you had, that purpose for the heavens, which was uh, never understood until that point, that we can understand that we don't have to worry about a specific nation that we now are all of us, every single person here on earth that we're, we all have the same exact opportunity for the same blessings that we, we, um, we just have to believe that gospel that we can be called uh, out of that group that we're going to um, be seated in heavenly places that we're already seated in heavenly places, but that we have that future glorification to look forward to. It's uh, such a beautiful thing. We understand that you can do things that we could have never asked for. And for that, we're thankful. And we pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And the recording. Yeah, let me. Thank you recording. very much.